Hello, today this is a video that will cover the AWS Sense Level 1 Module 2, which is the safety and health of welders. I teach at a couple community colleges, and one of them that I teach at part-time um, offers the American Welding Society Sense Level 1 program. The material covered here today is safety that can be included in any welding program because it's all general and important information. For this particular video, I am gonna focus on module two in that AWS Sense Level 1 and the material that you would need to pass a test. To pass a test to get a certificate for AWS, you would have to get 100% on the exam. Anybody that scores under 100% must retake the exam with a max of three chances. I'm gonna begin by talking about potential hazards. Many of you would already know, even if you've never welded before, that welding does pose some dangers. A few things worth mentioning are burns. We can get burnt by touching hot metal. We can get burnt from arc rays coming across a welding arc and then having exposed skin. We could also get what we call flash burn, which is uh, light from the bright light from the arc welding, whether it be stick, MIG, TIG, or flux core, that would actually put like a light burn on the eyeball, which is similar to getting like a light sunburn if you stayed outside at the beach for a little too long. Some of the things we'll talk about with burns in this uh, lecture is uh, first degree, second degree, and third degree burns. So first degree burns would be something like being outside in the sun for too long where your skin would turn red. That same thing can happen to a welder uh, just by not being covered up. A second degree burn is something that causes the skin to blister. So if I was welding, I walked away for a minute, I came back and I forgot that my piece was still really hot, I grab it, whoop, too hot, I could get blisters on my fingers or, you know, in my arm if I leaned on a hot piece of metal. A third degree burn being the worst is something that would actually burn through the skin and into the tissue. What we need to consider when we are welding is that there is a lot of bright light when we deal with arc welding. Um, some of this light is visible and some of it is not. We want to be concerned with the ultraviolet light that we cannot see. Another potential hazard that we see in welding is fumes. Okay, so when we weld on various materials, it may have paint or oil on it, and it's burning it, and those fumes are coming up. Other things that we want to consider are the materials we are actually welding on. So if we're welding on something like stainless steel, which has nickel and chromium, the chromium can produce hexavalent chromium, which is a carcinogen. So we want to consider ventilation, which we will talk about here shortly. Other materials to consider for toxic fumes are zinc, cadmium, chromium, lead, and beryllium. Those can put off toxic gases, which is dangerous to the welder. Other items to consider, which seems simple, but sharp objects. When we cut our materials, possibly using a shear, we may have a sharp edge on there. We always want to consider those sharp edges and make sure we file them off or wear gloves when handling materials. There are electrical risks when we are welding with anything that strikes an arc. I have a machine on both sides of me back here, which this would allow me to stick and TIG weld. And this machine is a multi-process machine, which allows me to stick, MIG, TIG, and flux core weld. Regardless, these are static machines, meaning they are plugged into a wall or an outlet, and then the power is then converted to what we need to weld. We can weld at amperages that are up into the hundreds. Amperage is the dangerous part of electricity that could potentially stop the human heart. These machines are designed in a way that they are safe, but if you don't take precaution or you do something stupid, essentially, you could get uh, electrically shot. Also, we wanna consider, is there water in the area where you're gonna be using an electric arc? Heights, maybe you're not gonna be up 
high in a welding shop where you're practicing and learning, but when you get out into the job in the workforce, you may be in the field and you may be climbing a skyscraper. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we talk about harnesses and uh, you know what can we do to make sure that we have fall prevention safety devices in use. Heavy objects, although these pieces are nice and light, when you get out to the real world, these may be hundreds or thousands of pounds of material, 40 foot I-beams or uh, 20 foot pipe that is schedule 80 and very heavy. So we always wanna lift with our legs, not with our back. And we wanna make sure that we have enough people or tools or equipment to lift these heavy objects. Falling debris could also happen on the job. You're walking out and there's crane operators lifting these heavy objects. We want to make sure we are aware of our surroundings. Okay, so those are some of the potential risks that we deal with as welders. There's a federal organization called OSHA, which is Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They provide us with safety rules and procedures, and they also come around and check to make sure that our workplaces are safe for us to work. Some of the words you may hear in the field would be confined space. Confined space would be maybe an area that you can get into where it's smaller or it's in a tank or a tube or a tunnel or some type of maybe restricted area, but we can get in there to complete some work. But it's not you know, a full-time thing where you're working in there. You're there for a short period of time, you do the work and then you exit. We need to have somebody on watch when we are in confined spaces and sometimes they're checking our oxygen levels uh, to make sure that those working in there are safe. A hot work permit is something that we uh, have to get when we are working on the job um, for anything that poses a fire hazard. So anything that heats up an open flame or sparks that could start a fire, we would need a hot work permit to work on the job. Lockout tagout. This is an important thing for when we are working in certain locations and let's say we're working in an elevator shaft, uh, maybe we need to make sure that that elevator cannot get lifted up or come down because we're working in that vicinity. Another thing that we would do is if this machine was damaged, something's wrong, we need to fix it. We wanna make sure that we lock it out and tag it out and the key is in the location where it belongs to make sure nobody can unlock this and turn it back on while people could be working on it. That would just be an example. There are thousands of examples for lockout tagout. The next most important thing that I wanna talk about would be PPE, personal protective equipment. As a welder, you wanna be dressed properly. We are dealing with hot open fire and uh, sparks that are flying from different welding processes and things like that. So to start, we want to be clothed correctly. Although you may not be able to see my legs standing here, I have uh, denim pants on that go down all the way to my boots. I need to have a pair of work boots or work shoes, um, no gym shoes or sandals uh, when we're actually welding. You can see that I am wearing a FR flame retardant jacket that when I begin the weld, although I might not be buttoned all the way up now, I would button up so that way I'm covering my neck so sparks uh, can't get there. Slag when you're chipping doesn't fly into your jacket. Um, I wanna make sure that these are buttoned up because I don't wanna burn my skin here. Safety glasses must be worn at all times when working in a shop. So when you walk out of your classroom and you go into the shop, put these on and leave them on. When you are welding, these stay on under your welding mask. Maybe you're cutting, it stays on under your mask. If you're wearing a pair of goggles, these are meant to fit under that pair of goggles. Respirator, when we're working with anything that could give off some toxic fumes, hard hats, uh, welding hoods, goggles, things like that, that we're gonna need to weld or work in a certain area. So this hood here is meant for a variety of different uh, brightnesses to say, uh, because this one will allow me to change the settings. So on this particular hood, this will go from a five to a 13. Generally speaking, 
most of your arc welding processes for stick, make, tag, or flux core, whatever it might be, requires about a shade 10. But always check in a textbook or a manufacturer, based on the amperage, will create different uh, levels of light. So we wanna make sure that we are uh, you know, protecting our eyes by using maybe a nine, a 10, 11. Maybe we're gonna weld for 12 hours a day. Maybe we wanna step it up to that 11 just because it's a long period of time staring at an arc through a hood. For goggles, we generally use a shade five when we do any type of oxyacetylene welding or any type of oxy fuel cutting. Whether that gas is acetylene, propylene, propane, map gas, uh, we want to make sure we have a lighter shade, but good enough to protect our eyes because it is a bright flame. Another thing to consider when we are in the shop would be any type of loose clothing, long hair. Uh, we're not wearing you know, business ties or anything that could fly out. We have rotating objects uh, that could be a huge uh, problem. Okay, We don't cup up our bottom of our pants or we don't wear weld uh, uh, hoodies because sparks can land in those spots. The next topic would be ventilation. Ventilation is required in an area that is less than 10,000 cubic feet or has less than 16 foot ceilings. We want forced ventilation for anything smaller than that. Um, in our shops, we have forced ventilation for all of our welding stations. Um, but you might be out on the job and maybe you're working in a small room. We want to have some type of ventilation um, in those smaller areas. The best place for ventilation would be welding outside. If you can weld outside, great. If you can't, then we should make some adjustments to make sure uh, we have the ventilation we need. The next topic would be fires. So we have a fire triangle, which would include a fuel, oxygen, and heat and we can have combustion and we could have an open fire there are a couple different uh, classifications of fires so we have a which would be common combustibles paper wood plastic cotton things like that B is anything flammable liquid such as like kerosene and oils or gasoline diesel whatever uh, C is electrical fires D is combustible metals K is kind of a liquid fire, kind of like B. However, this one's its own classification. It's K for kitchen. So that would be cooking oils and things that are really hard to put out because if you sprayed water on them, it would just spread the fire. If we do have a fire, we wanna make sure that we have a fire extinguisher close by. To use a fire extinguisher, we use the acronym PASS, P-A-S-S. What you would do is you would grab the fire extinguisher, pull the pin, aim at the base of the fire, squeeze the handle, and then sweep the fire extinguisher side to side. The next big topic worth mentioning would be uh, oxyacetylene tanks. Oxyacetylene tanks could pose a huge risk because you have a flammable gas and a pure oxygen sitting right next to each other so we can create a flame that's somewhere in the four to five thousand range depending on what the fuel gas might be when we look at a fresh tank of oxygen it's in uh, pressure in excess of 2000 typically around 2200 psi at 70 degrees that pressure can expand and contract with heat and cold a tank of acetylene uh, is a lower pressure tank, which would be around 250 PSI, give or take at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. We never lay a tank of acetylene on its side because an acetylene tank has a porous material, then it's filled with a certain percentage of acetone, and then it has the acetylene then pressurized in that tank. Once you tip it to the side, the acetone will move towards the valve. And when you hook up your actual uh, tank, you can get acetone into lines, which can then break down the, the soft brass or copper uh, materials that we use or the hose itself. Speaking of the hoses, 
We use a Siamese style hose where they're connected and you would have one green for oxygen and one red for your particular fuel gas. A lot of cases we use acetylene because acetylene is still the hottest burning gas even though they discovered it in the 1800s. Um, and that gas mixed with oxygen can get a neutral flame around 5,600 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we use an oxidizing flame, we can get up about 6,000 or even more. So we're talking a pretty hot flame. Uh, steel itself would melt at about 2,800 degrees. Uh, so that's a hot flame. We can melt metal no problem. When we are using our acetylene and oxygen tanks, we wanna make sure that they are strapped to a cart and chained, or if they are in a manifold room or in storage, that they are also chained up. But when they are in a storage area, we wanna separate those two tanks by a fire wall or a certain distance to make sure we are safe. We never use oil on any regulator for any reason. Something that AWS uh, mentions is that we never cut against uh, concrete. Because what happens is the concrete will heat up and the concrete is somewhat porous and it can begin to pop and kind of fly all over the place. So it's something to keep in mind. A striker is what should be used only some type of strike or flint lighter when we light our fuel gases. We do not use a pocket lighter or matches and we surely don't use somebody else's lit flame to get our flame to light. A little bit about arc welding. When we say the word arc, that means we're striking an arc, which means that we have to use some form of electricity. Uh, we're using electricity to create an arc, which is the heat needed to melt metal. Uh, we do not want to be uh, using any type of electricity around water. We need to consider things such as uh, when we stick weld, when the machine is on, this torch is live. When we TIG weld, scratch start method and not using a foot pedal, which is essentially a remote, that torch is most likely a live torch. Okay, so we wanna make sure that we don't just set those torches on a table because we will have the flow of electrons once that connection is complete. We wanna make sure that we understand the rating on our machines and that we can't try to overdo it on a machine. But luckily these machines will have a duty cycle built into them and it'll allow you to weld at a certain amperage and voltage for a certain amount of time based on a 10 minute period of time. So if it's a, I don't know, a Precision TIG 275 I have here, um, I can look at the back of the machine and it'll provide me with some sort of duty cycle. This particular machine has a duty cycle at 275 for stick, 31 volts at 40%. Meaning if we ran this thing at 275, it could run for four minutes out of 10. And then at that point, it may shut off and you may get a little alarm, a little light that lights up, it looks like a thermometer, and it's shutting the machine off from welding, but the machine is still uh, using its fan to cool it down. So all it's doing is preventing you uh, from overheating the machine. So be aware of what your duty cycles are on a machine. Uh, the smaller, cheaper 110 machines that you could get at the store, a big box store, those will typically have a much lower duty cycle uh, just because you don't have the power input. Some general items that should be covered when we talk about safety is that oxygen is never used as a replacement for compressed air. We wanna make sure we're using oxygen for its intended purposes and compressed air, if we're gonna blow something off and clean it, that's what we use it for. We don't use oxygen as a substitute. When using tools in our shops or on the job, make sure you use the right tool for the job. Don't use a wrench as a hammer. That's not what it was made for and you shouldn't use it for that purpose. In our shops, we wanna make sure that you put the tools back when you're done. If a tool breaks, let your instructor know. We understand that things are going to break and we will replace them. We also purchase these tools and we wanna make sure we offer these tools for our students, um, but if you don't return them, we can't uh, have them here to share for everybody. Finally, when you are in a welding booth or you're using a grinder or some type of tool, that you turn on, make sure you turn it off. 
I can't count how many times I've had students turn on a grinder, sharpen their tungsten, and then just walk away with the machine on. Somebody could walk by, their hand could slip in there, and we could have a problem on our side. So if you take something out, put it back. If you turn it on, turn it off. If you made a mess around it, clean it off. With that being said, the last thing I wanna mention is shop cleanup. In our classes, we do a booth check before any student can ever leave our shop. That includes sweeping the booth, shutting off the machine, wrapping up your leads, plugging things back in, such as maybe we have our TIG torches plugged in, and then you unplugged it, you put your stick stinger in there, and when you're done, put the TIG torch back in there because it's got a bunch of hoses hanging off of it. So we wanna make sure that that is not just dangling there because these torches are very expensive. Any extra materials that you didn't weld on or rods that you didn't use, please return them back to the place that they belong. And any scrap metal you have, make sure you find a scrap bin that is going to match the material you will put in there. For example, we weld steel, we weld stainless, and we also weld aluminum. So if we are welding aluminum, find the aluminum scrap bin. If you're welding steel, find that steel scrap bin so that way we can uh, scrap our materials correctly. This covers the safety and health of welders. Thanks for watching the video. Study up and enjoy.